The arms sewn to his torso, his legs sewn together, his teeth reshaped to be able to fit two tusks, his tongue gouged out, and various tools used by a maniacal to modify the body to resemble that of a walrus. Such is the plight of his victim who screams and cries in agony cannot be heard by anyone except him. How did the man land in a situation like this? To understand, we need to start at the beginning of the movie. The movie opens with two best friends, Wallace and Teddy, hosting their podcast, The Nazi Party. It is where the two find and mock embarrassing viral videos, and today, it's Kill Bill Kid's turn, who accidentally severed his leg while showing off his katana skills, which means he's actually really good or that's the sharpest katana ever made. Wallace plans to interview this internet sensation and soon leaves for Canada. The next scene takes us to Canada, where Wallace has just landed and is having a friendly repartee with an airport official who gives him do's and don'ts in Canada, don'ts weighing more. Wallace soon arrives in Manitoba, where the kid lives, and finds out that the kid has taken his own life with the same katana that severed his leg. Later that evening, Wallace sits at a bar and rants about it to Teddy on the phone. He is irritated because he traveled all the way to Canada for nothing and decides to find another person who can quench his thirst for weird content. While relieving himself, he finds a handbill, stuck on the wall among many, from a man that promises a free stay and many exciting stories he wishes to share. Since it is not totally suspicious whatsoever, Wallace is immediately drawn to the offer, and after getting the address, he travels to Bifrost to meet Howard Howe, a retired seaman who was confined to his wheelchair. Upon arriving at the mansion, Howard welcomes Wallace with tea and tells him about the time that he was a seaman and he had the opportunity to serve Mr. Ernest Hemingway, one of the greatest American novelists, some liquor, for which he earned his appreciation. Wallace helps himself to a second serving of tea and enjoys it while looking at the empty bottle of the liquor that was once served to Hemingway and now adorns Howard's collection when he spots something on display which Howard describes as the baculum of a walrus. Wallace doesn't know what that means, but when Howard explains that it is a walrus genital, Wallace becomes more excited and starts playing with the bone. Howard has a different sense of appreciation for walruses, and particularly this one walrus who saved him when he got lost at sea. Their ship sank after hitting an iceberg, and as Howard swam to save himself, a slimy body brushed past his. The next thing he remembered was waking up on an island and seeing the majestic creature nearby. He soon realizes the walrus saved his life and named it Mr. Tusk. Wallace tries hard not to lose control over his body, but the seco barbital laced in the tea soon takes effect and Wallace passes out. Howard seems unbothered and even addresses Wallace as Mr. Tusk. The next morning, Wallace wakes up strapped to a wheelchair, still a little disoriented, but soon starts panicking and crying when he finds his left leg amputated. Howard doesn't help and keeps meddling with his brain and tricking him into thinking that a venomous spider got in his pants and bit him, and he had called a doctor who had to amputate his leg to stop the venom from spreading. When Wallace asks for his phone, Howard refuses to give it to him, making absurd explanations that Wallace cannot comprehend. Howard keeps Wallace high on morphine to curb his pain, but it also immobilizes his other limbs. He soon realizes something is wrong, finally, and confronts Howard about it. But Howard sticks to his story and even sings a jingle about what happened when Wallace starts screaming for help. Suddenly, Howard stands from his chair, revealing he can walk and slaps a screaming Wallace hard for calling him a psycho. Wallace cannot believe what is happening to him and where he went wrong with Howard that he's subjecting him to such torture. Howard sits back on his seat and delves into his plan to fit Wallace into the realistic walrus suit he created. Meanwhile, back home, Wallace's girlfriend, Allie, cries as she talks about how hollow she feels with Wallace and how she hates herself for not taking a stand for herself and waiting for a man who is cheating on her. So she does what she feels is befitting in this threadbare relationship. She cheats on Wallace with his best friend, Teddy. At the mansion, Wallace is slipping in and out of sleep because of the heavy use of sedatives on him. 
He wakes up to a ringtone and finds himself alone. He wheels himself to his ringing phone and calls back Allie, whose call he just missed. But Allie, who had been trying to reach him for the last three days, plugs her phone into the charger and leaves it on silent, because of which Wallace's call goes unnoticed. Wallace manages to leave a voicemail asking for help and narrating the entire ordeal. He cries as he apologizes to her for his behavior as he repents. He then tries to call Teddy, but Teddy doesn't pick up as he is with Allie and feels it is best to ignore it. His phone goes to voicemail and Wallace pleads with him to call the cops and tries his best to draw a map of the place. But before he can say anything more, Howard knocks him unconscious with a shovel. Howard continues turning Wallace into Wallace the Walrus, and as he mutilates and stitches him back up, he narrates his life story. He was a Duplessis orphan whose parents were murdered in Montreal when he was 10. He was placed in an abandoned boys' home in Quebec, which later shut down, and all the boys, including him, were sent to insane asylums where for the next five years, he was tortured and sexually abused by the clergy. Now that Howard has mutilated Wallace's body enough to be able to fit in the walrus suit that Howard has made using human skin, he sews Wallace's body with a suit and uses tibia bones from Wallace's amputated legs to carve them into tusks to complete the transformation. Howard starts conditioning Wallace into becoming a walrus and even throws him in water to make him learn to swim. Once underwater, Wallace gets petrified to see that he is not Howard's first victim, as the remains of his previous victim, who couldn't make it, still lie at the bottom of the pool. Realizing that Wallace must be in danger after receiving his terror-ridden voicemails, Allie and Teddy fly to Canada and try to search for him, following the route he had taken. With no luck, they turn to the police for help. At the station, a detective gives them the contact of an ex-cop from Quebec who was hunting a serial killer, and the fact that Wallace mentioned his leg being amputated in the voicemail he had left, the detective feels that the ex-cop can help them. Ali and Teddy soon meet Guy Lapointe, a former Sud to Quebec inspector who has been hunting Howard for the last 10 years. He should have used bar restrooms more often. He paints a gruesome picture of what Howard does to his victims, and if Wallace has been kidnapped by Howard, he warns them that they might not find Wallace the same as they last saw him. Because the last victim they found had his tongue pulled out and a hole in his upper palate with fragments of the tibia bone, he believes that Howard is creating a monster of his victims. The three start tracing the clues, and with all the information they've collected, they discover Wallace's rental car submerged in a lake. Fearing the worst, Allie tries to jump in, but Guy stops her, saying Wallace is not in the car. He hands them guns so they're prepared to face a very dangerous criminal as they make their way through the woods. But they didn't have to wait much as they soon hear the wailing and crying of a man from nearby, and they follow the sound that leads them to Howard's mansion. In the mansion, Howard continues the conditioning by feeding raw fish to Wallace and helping him learn to swim as the new being he's been made into. During one such session, Howard confesses that just before he was rescued from the island, he had eliminated and eaten Mr. Tusk after being together for six months. Overwhelmed by the guilt of what he had done, he has been trying to repent by not getting an actual walrus, but instead dedicating the past 15 years of his life to turning his victims into cosplaying the walrus that once saved his life and reliving the fateful day so he could change what happened and give Mr. Tusk another chance at life. To prepare him for survival, Howard comes wearing a similar walrus suit made of human skin and challenges Wallace to fight him. Howard wants Wallace to kill him if he wants a chance at survival, and as Wallace's survival instincts kick in, he fatally impales Howard with his tusks and strikes him multiple times, projecting his anger and hatred toward the man who destroyed his life and body. But to his dismay, even though it is his end, Howard feels satisfied that he could, at last, fulfill his life's mission and create Mr. Tusk, and soon breathes his last breath. At that moment, Allie and Teddy enter the hidden chamber where Howard would keep Wallace and find Wallace bellowing while a lifeless Howard lies nearby. Allie bawls upon seeing the plight of the man she once loved. Just then, Guy comes in and points his gun at bellowing Wallace, and Allie can be heard screaming 
asking him not to do it before everything goes black. The scene then cuts to one year later, when Teddy and Allie visit the Manitoba Exotic Animal Sanctuary. They stop outside an enclosure, and Allie calls out to Wallace, hoping to see him again. She presents him with a fish, and Wallace comes out of his hiding to eat it, practically immune to salmonella at this point. Wallace has been living as a walrus for a year now, and has forgotten mostly everything of what it means to be a human. But when he looks at Allie crying, he is suddenly taken into a flashback where Allie says that her grandpa once told her that crying is good, as it separates us from the animals as it shows we have a soul. A tear trickles down Wallace's face as Allie tells him she loves him and asks him to never forget that. She soon leaves with Teddy, and Wallace retreats into his hiding and starts to bellow. And that's a wrap for this movie recap. Thank you for watching.